Now I'm here to make a very special announcement. That's why we're here in this beautiful ballroom with a few lovely people who randomly were able to get here. Um, Sirius Technology Advanced Research, which is a little group that we found that brought out the film Sirius and um, is we're doing a lot of this work now under that umbrella, uh, is, is announcing a $100,000 challenge and award available to anyone who can deliver to us here in the Virginia area an operational device that meets certain criteria. Money's in the bank. Go to our website, you see it's been donated or it's there. Now, you say $100,000 isn't much money, but it actually is because if you look at the fact that right now there is a quantum energy generator that's on the internet, it's supposed to be open source. There is information from the Keshe Foundation. There's information from other things that are now supposedly open source that people are saying there's YouTube video showing it's doing this. Um, and people have asked me why, in fact, one of our supporters for the serious film said, why don't you just go and build one? I said, look, to hook up our DVD player, my wife has to do that. I am such an idiot, you know, give me a defibrillator or a respirator, no problem, but the, that stuff, no. So look, I don't build, I'm not a machine guy with a lathe, so we would have to engage someone to do that. And people said, well then why don't you? I said, because I have several thousand videos and several thousand documents in two dimension purporting these claims. And it would take probably a hundred million dollars to build them all up. And how you determine which one is legitimate. So we're turning this around the other way. If it is what people say it is, it's supposed to cost five to seven thousand dollars to make one of these, even custom lathing, custom, you build it, you bring it, we're not going anywhere because we've tracked all over the world and it's been just a wild goose chase, to be honest with everyone. We will have it independently tested. And if it is legitimate, it has to have plans with it that are not secret and that nothing has been altered what, that would allow us to independently reproduce it by somebody who is not associated with the inventor or the people who are advocates of the technology, truly an independent person. If it is not reproducible, it isn't science, and it isn't going to be made seven, a, a billion copies to run seven billion people's homes, cars, and what have you. And if it is not able to be tested transparently until proven otherwise, we're going to have to assume that there's a trick. Now, it, that's perhaps too harsh, but that's been our experience. And since we have expended almost a million dollars already going all over the world doing this, trying these other approaches, this is the approach that, that we're willing to go forward with that I think will work. And I think everything else is a waste of time, money, and resources. Now, what are the criteria for getting this award? Okay, number one, it cannot be something running off a wall socket because there could be a circuit in there tricking the power phase angle. I just explained that. Cannot. If it's running on a battery pack or uh, capacitors or something that starts up the system, those have to be completely recharged from the output while it carries a load. What do I mean by that? Let's say you've got this prototype, proof of principle thing, and it starts up, it needs 500 watts of power to start it up, and it runs and then it kicks in and it has a circuit where it is legitimately pulling in from the zero point energy field, quantum vacuum flux field, if you want to call it that, the Dirac C, whatever your favorite term is, and it's putting out five kilowatts of power. Well, if you have an output of five kilowatts, it should be no problem to take out of that five kilowatts and put the 500 watts back into the front end so that those batteries stay 100% charged. Got it? I can help design that circuit in my sleep, by the way, even if it has to be a switching circuit between batteries. Some people say, oh, you can't do that because it kills the thing. I said, good, then you put in a switching circuit on the front end batteries, but no tricks. And then it's running four and a half kilowatts of usable excess electricity to run appliances or what have you. I'm just using this as an example. Now it could be something that only it takes a hundred watts in that stays charged from output and a kilowatt's coming out. So you have 900. 
For a proof of principle thing, it doesn't have to be something that's going to be ready to go to manufacture. It has to be something that I can put in front of the people that I meet with week in and week out and week in and week out who want to see a solution like this. They really do, but they haven't seen it. And when I tell them, well, I've seen them at this SCIF or at this lab, and they go, yeah, but I want to see one. And you know what? The public needs to see one. But they need to see it with independent testing by people who are going to publish and put their name to the fact that I tested this prototype and this is what it is doing. And then another laboratory says, I've taken the plans that were provided for the prototype and I have independently recreated the effect, reproducibility, at least once, if not three times, which is what we'd use the rest of the funds for that we've, we've, we've um, been able to have donated and made through the film series. So the $100,000, we call it the Serious Challenge and Award. And it's $100,000 for anyone who can legitimately bring, we're not going to go to the outback of Australia to look at a kind of should have product, maybe. It's got to be brought here, not to DC, but to Virginia, near the University of Virginia. And it has got to be able to pass these criteria. It also cannot have anything in it that is hazmat, hazardous material. Now, why do I say that? We have tested and looked at some devices that were using low-level radioactive materials. Not good. You can make a dirty weapon out of that. It's never going to be able to be mass manufactured. So it can't have hazmat. It can't has, have anything really toxic in terms of hazmat chemicals. It cannot have a um, effect that is harmful to the environment. So it will be tested for environmental effects. What do I mean? Well, I mentioned this gentleman who's this incredible trans-dimensional physicist and engineer down in, in uh, Hunts, near Huntsville. He had an uh, experiment he was doing that actually created a, a vector and created a space-time bubble. And amazingly, you know, like he accidentally dropped a bolt into this energy field and it, it vanished. You could put a broom handle into it and that part of it would go into another dimension. This sounds like science fiction, it is not. The senior scientist in Naval Research Labs, who I know very well, who has stayed at our home, I've known him for many years, saw this. But unfortunately, when he was experimenting with that, it created an energy field where a scientist who was standing next to it, half of his body got hit by that and half of his body is aging at twice the rate of the other half, literally. Sounds like something out of the outer you know, limits or whatever they used to call that. So these technologies, it has to be something that's, that's safe. It also needs to be something that is not going to disrupt FCC channels, federal communication. In other words, if you switch that on and your local FM radio station goes offline, you're going to get a knock on the door. Or if you switch it on and all cell phones are disabled or if you switch it, and this is an effect of these sciences. You know, um, there, there's a, a guy who works in the science director at CIA and, um, that I've known for 20 years, and um, he says, we have a name for these things, WSFM, Weird Science and Frickin' Magic. <laughs> and my uncle uh, wor you know, worked on the, the Apollo landing, uh, the lunar module, and at Northrop Grumman, they just call it PFM, pure frickin' magic. <laughs> and it is. It's the high end of electromagnetic, mainly magnetic field sciences that result in all kinds of phenomena. So you have to be careful. You have to know what you're doing. And some people have known and some haven't. So there, there, is a, there, there are effects. So it would have to be able to pass the test that there's not a biohazard, an FCC communication hazard to normal bandwidths of cell phones and radio and TV because you don't, or what have you, or create inadvertently a blackout in electromagnetically in an adjacent building. I know one guy who was experimenting with this and every time he turned on the system, everyone's garage doors in his neighborhood were going up and down like this, seriously. So these are all things that have going to have to be evaluated. In 20 some, 24 years of me being involved with this, I now know what to look for which someone starting out would take them 24 years to discover. Um, and the device also, meeting this challenge, 
has to be stable. What do I mean by that? Let's say it works in Massachusetts, but you move it from Massachusetts to Virginia and the electromagnetic and magnetic field of the earth is different in Virginia than it is there. And even from place to place, you can go to places in Colorado where there's huge changes in the, in the Gaussian, the measurement of magnetic field at one point versus another, even in one valley. If it works in one point and doesn't work in the other, that's a problem. Unless you've developed an algorithm of how to attune it to adjust for the magnetic field variations that surround Earth. That is a serious technical issue. Believe me, I tell you, I have seen things that absolutely work in one point. You move it, it doesn't work. That's not what we call robust. So the technology has to be open source. The person cannot want a patent or want to keep it secret. It has got to be something that can be openly shared with the public. It has to be stable. It has to be free of hazardous effects. It needs to be something that's putting out a measurable over unity of amount of power, meaning more than what's going in, with the input power continuously charged. And it needs to be able to run in a stable fashion for a sustainable amount of time. What do I mean by sustainable? At least a day. Now, we were once involved in an operation out of the Caribbean, and a man had sort of resurrected the uh, Tesla Stubblefield earth battery. Everybody know what that is? You put these zinc and copper poles in the earth, and you actually can run. Uh, and, and he had you know, several wa hundred watts of electricity coming out of this thing, but it would only work for about 20 minutes. 15 minutes and then it would go cut off. We went, why? Why is it cutting off in, in 20 minutes? Hmm, something not right. Well, we thought maybe it just needed more engineering. So we took this. It turns out that the electrolyte content of the soil, it took a genius to discover this from documents from Russia from the early part of the 20th century. There has to be a certain electrolyte composition of the soil to feed and be flowing through these copper and zinc alternating pipes for that stubble-filled Tesla battery. There, we have pictures of it on our website to operate on a sustainable basis. And that was the secret that the inventor, not the inventor, the guy trying to reproduce it didn't know, but he didn't want to admit he didn't know it. So he started playing a scam on us, which cost us a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, so, that's why it has to be something that can work on a reliable basis um, for a sustained amount of time. Because if it conks out in 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes, there's something fishy going on. And that to, to, to troubleshoot that failure could very well cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, literally, to get to the bottom of it with some of the most brilliant people in the world who know this particular area of electromagnetic phenomena. And that's a very, very small number of people that we know of who can actually work on this with us who aren't assigned to the agency or to Lockheed Skunk Works or what have you. So we have to do this in a way that has our eyes wide open, having learned what we have over the last few um, dozen or so years. Uh, if someone has such a thing, and I am th convinced it's out there, they need to contact us and there will be on our website an application and a questionnaire so that we can do an initial intake review of it. And then they will be, if it passes all those evaluation criteria, they will be invited to come to have it tested. But they also must leave with it the plan so it can be reproduced. Because if they have, for example, done something that works and it's legitimate, but they do something like Stan Meyer did, where he left out or just changed by a few thousand voltages what the voltage or the hertz needs to be, no one will be able to reproduce it. And that doesn't help the planet. And we're not willing to do it. It has got to be independently reproducible by not me and not someone who's an advocate of new energy, but just a person who, who can, is skilled in the art of fabrication, machining, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, a team that can do that. 
Um, and if that can't be done, and if the person can't do it, and it also has to be done in a way so that the person isn't going back and forth with the inventor. Because if the plans can't, if they're not truly well thought through plans, where a skilled people, person can do it, like a proper formula, then the science may not be there. It may be a bunch of guesswork where you have to do an iterative thing. And where, now that we have seen this, where there have been scientists who have stumbled across an effect, but they didn't keep, or they didn't even know how to document what the voltage and frequency was when they hit that sweet spot. And so every time they try to create a device, it's, it's a bunch of guessing for months, and sometimes years, because they're not following a very rigorous scientific method or they don't have the right equipment. What do I mean by right equipment? It is not a trivial thing to be doing things with very high voltages and very high frequencies because you can't buy that from a, a normal Kawasaki analyzer or even your testing equipment. That's custom stuff. Um, and so to be able to do this properly, if it is something that requires that, you know, if it, the person hasn't been able to document it and then do a second version of it based on documentation, it may be that they just accidentally stumbled across an effect, but they don't know, honestly, what they did. And I know such a scientist in, in Canada who will admit this. He absolutely, he did have the effect, it actually was something that lifted, but he had no idea exactly what, what he did. And no one since has been able to reproduce it. So again, the sine qua non of science, independent in, in, in testing and verification, and independent transparent reproducibility at least once if not two or three times. So that's the requirement for this uh, star challenge and award. Um, I'm hoping someone steps up to the challenge and gets the award. I mean the hundred thousand dollars is sitting there in the bank so come take it. Um, but it's going to have to meet this criteria. It cannot be snake oil and it cannot be secret and it has to be open source. We do not want to talk to anyone, let me be very clear, who wants this secret, patented, or in any way an intellectual property <coughs> issue. It is our intent to do this as an open source, like then there's some op open source software, um, Linux, or I don't know what it is. Uh, I'm not a software guy. <laughs> I'm a, just a doctor from Virginia. Uh, but the, 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 the truth of this uh, is if the person is out there, or if some of these open source things that have just surfaced in the last year on the internet are legitimate, and they really do only cost five to seven thousand dollars for someone to make it, then they can get a pretty nice return for their trouble. Mm -hmm.